Good morning. Thank you. Don't y'all love this chatter? Yeah, come on in. Of course we have seats at the front. <laughs> Welcome to Central United Methodist. We are so glad you're here, here to worship the Lord this morning and to enjoy a moment of Sabbath rest. And so I hope that you get that at some point today. Well, we have a few announcements that I'd like to call your attention to. Of course, um, on the front of the bulletin, you can register your attendance here. Uh, if you have a smartphone, you can scan that code and put in your name and email address. That would be fantastic. But also look through there. Here are our prayer concerns on the back. Our new series that starts today, Fit for Life, okay? Let's see if we can't get fit over these next 40 days. I guess we're down to a few less than that now. Um, also, the Wednesday Lenten services, if you would like to join other believers on Wednesday at Aldersgate, there is a Lenten service followed by a quick lunch uh, for $7 if you'd like to join that. Open Table Market today has spinach and lettuce, so uh, that could fit into Fit for Life. Uh, go by and get your spinach and lettuce uh, after the service, and I think you're well on your way. Also, you'll see some other ministry needs that we have there. I would especially like to thank those that helped us with our Ash Wednesday service and pancake service. We had, it was just such a sweet time of fellowship and some pretty sweet pancakes, I might add. So all of you that joined us, I think, can vouch for what a great time that we had together. So I hope as these things come along that you'll join us. It's so much fun to get to know folks here at church and to enjoy that fellowship together. And so thank you, those that helped flip pancakes, stir batter, pour up syrup, all the things that it took um, for us to enjoy the evening together. And then also our Ash Wednesday service. So we have entered Lent, and you will hear more from David today about our series, Fit for Life. I hope that during this time of preparation that you will turn your heart toward the Lord and see what he wants to do in you as you prepare for his uh, crucifixion where he paid for your sin, but then for the resurrection glory that we get to celebrate on Easter. So let's take this time to not only look at, um, you know, all the ways we can be fit for life, but especially in our spiritual lives, how we're going to be fit to really celebrate the great, great joy that we have coming in Easter. We know the end of this story. And so uh, let's take these days to worship, to reflect, co to confess, so that as Easter comes, we can fully engage ourselves in the glory that is Easter. Let's worship.
I just, I, I love church life, okay? Um, maybe you can tell that. <laughs> I hope so, because I do. Uh, one of the reasons that I love church life, and particularly the music of the church, um, kind of just this, this kind of cyclical nature of things, okay? And so as we come today, Tammy has already reminded us it's the first Sunday in Lent. You know, when I, I grew up, I didn't really know what that was about. Lent was something you found in the dryer. <laughs> but Lent is it's, it's a rich, rich time in the life of the church, not too unlike the season of Advent, you know, where we, we come to ourselves. We look inward um, to see what we find there. And if there are things that need cleaning up, or straightening or tidying or maybe even perhaps things that don't serve us anymore and they need to go away well that's that's kind of what Lent is and so in the life of the church um, I, I think it's a beautiful thing and it's not by accident that the church provides times of the year where we get to do just that okay? and it begins today in the season of Lent you may remember if you attended last Sunday and our children were right over here and it was Transfiguration Sunday and we sang, come, Christians, join to sing, alleluia, amen, right? Yeah, we know that one. Um, in the season of Lent, and there's actually a children's song. We didn't sing it this year, but it, it talks about saying goodbye to alleluia just for a time in the season of Lent. So this next season, our music will reflect kind of that contemplative nature, that sort of introspective looking inside of ourselves and so it will be softer and gentler, um, maybe more quiet and soulful. And so that's, that's by design today. And so our first hymn that we're going to sing this morning, you may not recognize this by title. It's titled, O Christ the Healer. But hopefully you're going to recognize the tune. Um, it's one that's been around a long time. All, old tunes, particularly folk tunes, have two names. And this is a funny one. O, O, letter O, O, Wally, Wally, W A L E uh, L Y, O, Wally, Wally. Now, you may not recognize that, but it's the tune I'm sure you've heard many, many times like, The water is wide, I can't cross over. Oh, it's an old folk tune, and it's used over and over in the church, particularly for different sets of texts. And so that's what this one is about today. O oh, Christ the Healer, uh, we have come. And so it talks about the things that we can do. So let's stand together as we sing our opening hymn, O Christ the Healer. Oh, Christ the Healer, we 
as we pray together this morning. Father, we come knowing that you are gracious, that your mercies are new every morning, that great is your faithfulness. And so as we approach this time of, of Lent and we do need to stop and reflect and see the things in our lives that aren't quite right. As David reminded us um, on Wednesday night, that there are things that we want to get rid of during these days. And so for those of us that have thought about that, help us this morning, even just a few days later, to recommit to letting those things go. And for those of us that maybe haven't had the reminder, would you, in the quietness of this moment, maybe bring something to mind that isn't beneficial at this season of our life, that maybe doesn't line up with the truth of your word that we need to get rid of, that we need to let go of. So would you bring those things to our minds now? we know that sometimes letting go is very difficult because this is the known and we don't know what's coming next if we let go but Father I've watched your faithfulness over a lifetime and the next chapter has always been better than the one before the wilderness times have been hard there's been a lot of learning. There's been a lot of holding on to you because that's all I had. And so I pray that during these days that we would see that you have good things ahead for us, that there's nothing we need to let go of that isn't going to be worth it for what you want to pour into our lives. And so, Father, would you build into us confession and repentance and renewal during these days. Would you create in us a clean heart? At the end of this season, would we be better? Would be, we be more fit, more fit for life, more fit for living a fruitful spiritual life than we are today? And so even though these may be days of, of looking deep within, we know that at the end of this, that there is great, great celebration, that there is renewal, that there is a new season coming. And so we look with great faith and great hope to all that you will do during this season. And Father, we thank you that you've given us a model of how to pray so that we could join together and that we could pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, children, I'd like to invite you to come down uh, here on the, in the front. I'll sit with you. We're going to watch uh, Keely on the video today. So kids, if y'all want to come down and sit here at the front.
I would welcome you to join me. Come on down. Let y'all have the floor, but I may take the pew, okay? There we go. Come on down. There we go. Can y'all see? Do you need to scoot? Are you good? I hope y'all are having a great Sunday. Um, today, I'm just going to ask y'all a few questions, and they're pretty easy. So, first question, who is number one? Is it your brother or sister? Is it you when you're playing a game? I know that we always try and compete with each other. Um, it was the UNC Tar Heels, and now sadly they are no longer number one. Um, so this is a hard question to ask, but we're going to ask it today in regards to Jesus and this thing called the temptation test. And so in this story, um, Jesus is being tempted, and temptation is kind of a fancy word for test. So in this temptation, Jesus is asked this question of, who is number one? And he continuously is asked these other three questions. Is food number one? Is Jesus number one? Or is someone else number one? And these questions are important because every time Jesus is asked one of these questions, he always answers no. God is number one. And so that is really powerful because this was his kind of final test into seeing if he would be able to go out and show God's love and show that God is number one in his heart. And since he did this, he was able, he knows this love that God holds for him and for everyone else. And he believes truly in his heart that God is number one. So then he was able to go out and teach everyone else that. And he invites us to follow him and to have God as number one in our lives as well which is a really cool and awesome thing that he did. So that's kind of the story of today is figuring out who is number one in your life. And I think it's important to kind of look back at stories like this and just kind of realize how important it is to keep God number one and just kind of learn from all that he has given us. Um, and like Jesus learned that, you know, God's when God is number one, you can learn from the abundance of love and forgiveness and honesty that he provides. So yeah, that's an awesome story for today. And will you all please bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing everyone in today. And I pray that everyone is happy and healthy and has a great Sunday. And I also pray that you um, keep us um, in your hearts and also make sure we keep you in our hearts as number one and just kind of live it out, live out your light. And just understand that when you, when we have you as number one, we are able to kind of understand your love and abundance of happiness and honesty and forgiveness fully. So thank you. All right. Amen. All right. You'll have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you. At this time, we will um, enter our time of offering as we worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Uh, this morning, I was just thinking, you know, the Lord says, you know, try me. I just thought, can we outgive God? We cannot. We cannot. So um, this is one time I think we can put the Lord to the test. Uh, you just try to outgive him. I know every time I've tried... He pours blessings abundant. So this is our chance to give our tithes and our offerings back uh, for the work of the kingdom of God, to see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So ushers, when you're ready, come down and we'll receive the offering.
are grateful for these tithes and offerings that your church has given, and we ask for your blessing that they might be multiplied and used um, for your kingdom's work, not only here in Shelby, but in all parts of the earth. So we are grateful for your abundance in our lives, and um, we are grateful for those that have given in obedience to you. So we ask for your blessing, and we're asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. That sounded great. That's a song, at least the words I'm familiar with, but that was, that was maybe played to a different tune, and so it helped me to focus a little bit differently on the words. Thank you. Thank you for lifting our hearts, our minds, our souls to worship God this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Central United Methodist Church. Wait a minute. Let me back up. Let me back up. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Central United Methodist Church. My name is David Lee, and I'm the pastor here. And I'm so grateful to have you here with us today. And I want you to know that your presence is not, for, is not taken for granted, but that, uh, that we are grateful that you're here. And we hope that this time together can be a source of blessing for you as you are a blessing to us 
as we come together to worship God, to sing songs, and to hear God's word, that we may lift up our hearts and our eyes to the Lord, that he may be here with us. At least to see that he's already here. Beat us to it. Uh, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's, let's take a moment to greet one another in the peace of Christ. Um, please find somebody that you don't know and to welcome them to this time of worship. So let's take this time now to greet one another. Can we do that? Great. We are beginning the season of Lent, um, and when we think about Lent, right, I think um, it usually falls into kind of two categories for us as we look towards Lent. Um, one is, what are you going to give up, right? That's, that's what sometimes I think we think about, right? Well, Lent is coming, you know, people gave up meat back in the day, but what am I going to give up, right? And so we... We spend our time thinking about that. Or we think about the season of Lent, you know, these next 40 days, right? These next 40 days, what can I do? How can I grow? How can I be a little bit more faithful? How can I grow closer to God? So I feel like when we think about Lent, that's kind of where it falls, right? What do we give up? What do we give up for Lent? Or how can I, you know, maybe, you know, kind of ramp up my faith a little bit? Uh, for the season of Lent as we look towards the cross, right? Um, and, I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm here to tell you, that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing to think about Lent in those terms. But I feel like maybe if we only think about it that way, that we may miss the point. Um, that Lent is not only or it's not meant to be uh, just a 40-day thing. Just a 40-day thing like some fad diet or maybe like some article of clothing that's fashionable for one season and then you discard for the next, right? Because I think we have that kind of um, mindset sometimes in our culture, this kind of a disposable culture. You try on and then take off and I'll try this and then if it works, well, maybe, but otherwise I'll just get back to the way things were. But I'm telling you this because Lent at its core, at its heart, was not meant to be just a 40-day thing, but it was meant to be a lifestyle. It was meant to be a lifestyle. It's like trying something out or trying something on so that it can be a part of your life moving forward. Not to just put on the shelf, well, I tried that for 40 days, right? <laughs> Wasn't bad, maybe I'll go back to it, but it was meant to be a way to grow deeper with God in a way that you expand your faith, your life, where you are inviting more of God into your life. So it, it's not about just the 40 days. It's meant to be a lifestyle for you. And you know, 40 days, uh, we, 40 days is actually a good number to think about because it takes about 40 days to develop a habit. If you start trying something out for about 40 days, within about 40 days, it could become a habit. So what you do, what you take on, what you take off, <laughs> what you give up, <laughs> 
what you give up uh, can, through this Lenten season, become a lifestyle, right? So it's not just about what am I going to do for these 40 days. It's what would I like in my life? What would I want in my life? What is it that I want to see in my life? And how can I take this time, this season, to dip my toe in the water, to, to try it out a little bit, to try it on so that it could be a lifestyle moving forward? This, these Lenten practices are about bringing you more in alignment with God, with God's rhythm and the flow of God's spirit moving in your life, through the world, through your relationships. These Lenten practices are meant to be your ongoing fitness for life. Spiritual, yes, but also your mental, emotional, and physical health as well. Because all of it's connected, right? It really is all connected. All of it fits and works together. And that's the point. So not 40 days, not 40 days, but for life. We want to get fit and stay fit for life. And so today, we're going to be spending a little bit of time on this idea of Lenten practice, this Lenten discipline um, in the church, and what it's about. What is this thing about, and why we need to be taking it on, why we need it in our lives. So what are you doing for Lent? And today, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4. Um, to look at Jesus, the pioneer and the author of our faith, uh, who is leading us in the way. And as we do this, we're going to do this a little bit differently. Um, as I read the text, Matthew chapter 4, um, I want to I uh, point your attention to our altar. Um, Marilyn Jack, she's the ghost of Central. I, She's somewhere around, but she has her hands in a lot of things, especially when it comes to worship, especially when it comes to this altar space. And she pointed this out to me, and she said, this, based on our scripture reading today, this is an interpretation of how she envisions the text. And so as I read, I thought it would be great for us to be able to look, look upon the altar as you hear God's word today. Is that good? Can you see this okay? Yeah? All right, let's hope so. Let's hope so. All right. Matthew chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Well, actually, can you leave it on there? Can you leave it on there? Yeah. Thank you. But then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards, he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone." Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited 
on him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we are looking at the season of Lent and the practice of Lent, Lenten discipline. But let me tell you, don't bother looking it up in your Bible dictionaries because there was no such thing back then. There is some evidence, there is some evidence that early Christians fasted for 40 hours between Good Friday and Easter. But the custom of spending 40 days in prayer and self-denial, that didn't arise until much later. Much later when the initial rush of Christian adrenaline, right? That, that season when, when, when Jesus was here and that season of the early church that we read about and hear about in, in the book of Acts, until that was over. And then believers started to just get kind of ho-hum about their faith. Have you heard of such a thing? Uh, being a ho-hum kind of Christian? Do any of you know any ho-hum Christians? <laughs> But when the world didn't end, as the early disciples thought it would, right, the disciples, the followers, just stopped expecting so much from God or from themselves. So they would, you know, hang a cross on their wall, and they would just settle back into their more or less comfortable routines, right? Remembering their once passionate devotion to the way they remembered the other enthusiasms of their, of their youth I mean, if you were here last Sunday, it's like coming down from that, that mountaintop experience, you know, to, oh, to be young again and to feel like everything is possible. But little by little, Christians became devoted to their comforts. If you could imagine the soft couch, the flannel sheets, or the or the leg of lamb roasted with rosemary. These things made them feel safe and cared for, if not by God, well, at least them by themselves. They decided there was no contradiction between being comfortable and being Christian. And before long, it wasn't hard. It wasn't very hard to pick them out, or it was very hard, <laughs> my, my mistake. Before long, it was, it was very hard. It was very hard to pick up the Christians among the rest of the population. They no longer distinguished themselves by their bold love for one another. They didn't get arrested for championing the poor. They just blended in. They avoided extremes. They decided to be nice instead of holy. And God moaned. Hearing that, seeing this, someone must have suggested, hey, it's, a time, it's, it's time to call these Christians back to their senses. And the Bible gave us some clues as to how to go about something like that, right? Because we looked at Israel. They spent 40 years in the wilderness learning to trust the Lord. We saw Elijah spent 40 days they are in the wilderness before hearing the still, small voice of God on the same mountain where Moses spent 40 days listening to God give the law. And there was also the story about Jesus' own 40 days, right, that we just read about in the wilderness, a period of preparation between his baptism and his ministry, during which he was sorely tested by the devil. It was hard, it was awful, it was necessary. And so the church announced the season of Lent. And it comes from the old English word Lenten, meaning spring. Spring, not only a reference to the season before Easter, but also as an invitation to a springtime for the soul, a springtime for your soul. 40 days to cleanse the system and open the eyes to what remains when all comfort is gone. 40 days to remember what it is, what it is like to live by the grace of God alone and not by what we can supply for ourselves. 
I kind of, I think of this as an outward bound for the soul. Do you guys know what outward bound is? Yeah, outward bound? Um, outward bound, for those of you that may not know, is a nonprofit outdoor education organization. Um, they put on adventure programs to encourage individuals to test their physical limits and emotional limits uh, in challenging outdoor activities. And so these experiences are supposed to be life-changing. They are a means of building inner strength and growing a heightened awareness of human inter interdependence. There are 40 schools around the world. They serve about 200,000 students a year. And they have a location right here in North Carolina, right? I think they're more around the Blue Ridge Mountains area. Anyway, um, when it comes to these adventure um, outings, these outward bound programs, no one has to sign up, right? But if you do, then you give up any illusions that you are in control of your life because you place yourself, you're placing yourself in the hands of strangers who ask you to do foolhardy things like walk backwards over a precipice with nothing but a rope around your waist or to climb like a, like a sheer rock face with just your fingers and toes. But really, none of those things is the real test. Because while you're doing them, you have plenty of people around chit-chatting, and you know lunch is waiting for you in the cooler once you're done. The real test comes when you go solo. The strangers put you out all by yourself in the middle of nowhere and wish you luck for the next 24 hours. That's when you find out who you are. That's when you find out what you really miss and what you really fear, when all those comforts have been taken away, right? Some people uh, dream about their favorite food. Some long for a safe room with a, with a door and a lock, right? Others just wish maybe they had a nice soft pillow. But all of them, all of them find out what their pacifiers are, what their pacifiers are. These are the habits, the substances or surroundings they use to comfort themselves, to protect themselves, to block out the pain or the fear that are just parts of being a normal person, actually. The habits and the substances and the surroundings we use to comfort ourselves and to block out the pain and the fear or the loneliness and without those things, they're suddenly exposed. Like someone addicted to painkillers, right? Whose prescription is about to run out. It's awful. But it is necessary to encounter the world without anesthesia. To find out what life is really like with no comfort but God. I'm convinced that 99% of us or addicted to something, whether it's eating or shopping, blaming or taking care of other people. What are your pacifiers? The habits and the substances and the surroundings you use to comfort yourself, to block out the pain and the fear that really are just a part of our normal lives. Imagine a 24-hour period without that, without that thing. I thought about it. My mouth became dry, my palms became sweaty, right? My heart rate began to rise. Oh no, what am I going to do? What is that thing? The phone came to mind, social media came to mind, cable news outlets came to mind. The simplest definition of addiction is anything we use to fill the empty place inside of us 
that belongs to God alone. Addiction is simply anything we use to fill the empty place inside of us that belongs to God alone. That hollowness, as we, we sometimes feel, is not a sign that something has gone wrong. It's actually the holy of holies inside of us, the uncluttered throne room of the Lord our God. Nothing on earth can fill it, but that doesn't stop us from trying, right? Whenever we start feeling too empty inside, we stick our pacifiers in our mouths and just suck for dear life. For all we're, for all we're worth, they don't nourish us, right? The pacifiers don't nourish us, but at least they plug the hole and give us something to do. So to enter the wilderness in the season of Lent, right, is to leave behind them, leave those things behind, whatever it may be, and nothing is too small to give up. Even a chocolate bar will do. Think of it as a kind of fast for you during this season. That safety net or that safety blanket that you go to and just remove it. For 40 days, for 40 days, simply pay attention to how your mind travels in that direction. Ask yourself why. Why? Why, why, why it's happening and, and when it happens? What, what's going on when you start craving that Snickers bar, right? That thing that you're used to having, that you consume like water without thinking. Are you hungry? Well, what's wrong with being hungry? Are you lonely? Well, what's so bad about being alone? Try sitting with the feeling instead of fixing it and see what you find out. Chances are you will hear a voice in your head that keeps warning you what will happen if you give up your pacifier. You'll starve. You'll go nuts. You won't be you anymore. And if that doesn't work, the voice will move to level two. That's not a pacifier. That's a power tool. Can't you tell the difference? If you do not fall for that one, there is always level three. You know, if God really loves you, you can do whatever you want. Why waste your time on this dumb exercise anyway? If you do not know whom that voice belongs to, read Matthew's story again. And then tell that devil to get lost and decide what you will do for Lent. Better yet, decide whose you will be. Worship the Lord your God and serve no one else. Expect great things from God and from yourself. Believe that everything is possible. Why should any of us settle for anything less? That is what we're aiming for this Lent. More of God or bust. To be fit for life. Next week, next Sunday, we start training. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. David, it sounds like you've given us a challenge, right? Follow God or bust. <laughs> I really like that. We do have an opportunity in front of us today to follow Jesus into the wilderness. Um, we're going to do that with this closing hymn today. There'll be three verses. After the second, we're going to take just a little bit of an instrumental break. And while we do that break, I'm going to invite you to bring your attention right back over here to this altar table and contemplate Jesus in the wilderness and what that may be looking like for us. Let's stand together as we sing our closing.
What will you do for Lent this season? What will you do? This season is about drawing closer to God and letting go of the things that prevent us from drawing close. Take today, take this week to try and reflect on the things that are keeping you from God so that you can let them go for a season. So that you may draw close, that you may draw closer onto God and by doing so, draw closer to one another as God's people on earth. As you go, go in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen.